Hej allihopa, det här är Sam från Fragbite och jag sitter här med vår kommentator Nathanius som kastar Starcraft 2 vi bara tänkt snacka lite, så hi Nathan! Hi, that's a lot of Swedish. Yeah, that's a lot of Swedish, don't worry. I'll blur out all the obscenities. Okay, thanks. How are you doing? I'm, I'm doing pretty well. Um, woke up at like 7 o'clock, got to uh, harass the Muslim as he was trying to sleep. Yeah. And uh, just enjoying Sweden. Sounds about standard. Pretty much. <laughs> so obviously you're here to cast the, your, I think your third season of Fried Bike Masters, right? Or? Mm, something like that, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think we we did it on the tail end of uh, 2013 and then two seasons in 2014 and now. Oh. Yeah. Again, so. How's it, how does it feel to just come back here and do it all over again? I love it. I I mean, I'm, it's, I guess it's kind of obvious at this point. I'm a big fan of Stockholm. Yeah. I I like uh, working with Frybat especially. These yeah. guys take pretty good care of me, so it's I always get to have fun when I come out here. And uh, we've we've always had very interesting things happen in our in the Fragbite Masters tournaments yeah. that make it just a little bit different to the other ones. Like, are you referring to maybe like, say, Gung Fu Bando almost beating MMA last season? Yeah, that didn't really make a lot of sense. <laughs> um, we had some of the more interesting things. Like, you know, I think back to one of the first seasons I did when we had uh, Naniwa in the finals against Stardust. And no, no, I think, or was what? it Hyun? No, one of them was Naniwa oh, Stardust, yeah. and then it was like, you know, the whole shit dust thing yeah. came about. <laughs> oh, and, you know, it was yeah. pretty. It was pretty <laughs> funny, man. It was pretty funny. Yeah. Um, but uh, and then you know we had the the epic season of Zergs yeah. where you know eventually Vortex against Yan and a lot of people weren't even expecting Vortex to make it that far. But it's, it's always been pretty cool, and I think that we have a really really awesome lineup already for this season of Fragbite. Yeah. So like obviously, like the four players that qualified yesterday were or at the time this is released it might not come out the day like it might not be yesterday. But the players that came in for the first qualifier were like Rehin, Solki. Gung Fu Banda and then E Laser. And I mean, the, like, E Laser was probably the biggest surprise, right? Yeah, I don't think anybody was. Like, he's he just kind of. Showed kinda, up? He just kind of showed up and beat a bunch of people nobody thought he was going to beat. Yeah. <laughs> so, that's like stuff that you can't really count. You can't count on happening. You know, um, Marine Lord ended up taking out some guy that, like, I can't quite remember his name. It was like Quen or something, but he, like, be like, sort of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nobody knows who this Protoss guy is, but he just, like, <laughs> wrecked a couple of really good guys and almost made it through. And then, you know, unfortunately for Marine Lord, he, he did eventually have to face Soul Key, which yeah. is. Well, that sucks. Quite defeat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, like, so, so just looking forward, do you think the season is going to be just as interesting as all the previous ones, given what we've already seen? I, I think it, I think there's a chance it gets quite a bit more interesting. You know, the the opening up of the qualification spots has already made things a, a much more diverse than last season. But the invite setup, you know, having yeah. we've got the best of the best when yeah. it comes to the foreigners. You know, now we we have Snoot, we have returning Bunny who yeah. finished top four last season, and then you have the Naniwa. return of Naniwa, <laughs> right? Who yeah. Has uh, he's had quite a good record, you know, in his Fragby Masters participation already, and coming back already doing very well in, you know, um, you know, qualifying for WCS after only starting to play StarCraft again for like a month. Yeah, it's ridiculous. There's a, there's a chance that we see him go really far, and if he doesn't, I'm sure we'll still get some fun BM out of him. You know, <laughs> I'm sure it'll just be a, an exciting tournament because of how many uh, non-Koreans there are. Yeah. Okay, then. So if we focus on you more personally, you just announced a couple of days ago that you'd gotten a personal sponsorship for your event, uh, the Kappa Star League. Yeah. The two v two, the two v two season, like five thousand dollars from Ting, like. There, it must have been like three years ago at least uh, b until someone actually ran like a full-on like dedicated 2v2 tournament and that was like the and that was like the EG, EG Starcraft 2 Masters Cup or something like that when it was complete yeah. focus. It's ridiculous. Like, how does it feel to just bring that for try and bring that format back? Like, I'm sure other people have done it, tried to do it too. Like, how does it feel to get that much money just for a dedicated 2v2 tournament? Yeah, I'm, I'm in the really fortunate position yeah. of um, being pretty close with uh, the sponsor that I work with. Yeah. Uh, Jesse at Tang has really helped me as far as planning things. We've been talking about doing a tournament for a while, but the 2v2 aspect really came out of the, the community community's own interest in it you know base trade did uh, an online tournament about like a week you know a month or so ago and yeah. you know, the, the response was pretty good the games themselves are really good and a lot of cool cool moments were in that tournament that we don't really get to see a whole lot of and yeah. 
you know, I, I, I spoke to I spoke to Ting about it and we basically agreed really, you know, we want to do something a little bit different. We don't want to, you know, completely follow the same path that every other tournament goes on. And there's also some really good 2v2 maps that have been in the, in the works and we'll be looking to add some of the, the latest ones to the pool as we get ready for the tournament. But it really seems that the community has been a little more eager for some non-standard type yeah. of tournaments. And, uh, you know, one of the goals, the focus of the Kappa Star League has always been to allow for the players to just have fun, but also not worry about things like, you know, oh, I have to play a tournament in yeah. a week. I don't want to show my builds. Right. This is why we, we, we like doing things that are, you know, not normal at all. Yeah. Like, uh, I, I remember that I got so much enjoyment after a while watching, like, the the, uh, the team like we like map cups you know where the, all the custom maps yeah. and all that stuff with where amazing maps like fruitland were introduced and just <laughs> yeah. completely off the wall type of stuff so do you think that like do you think being different is sort of like the new thing to do in starcraft or do you, th do you still think that like just having these sort of things as one-off is just like is just like a fun addition to the completely serious side of wcs I think the biggest problem that any big esports title gets is that eventually you have a ridiculous number of tournaments right. running, and you know, for a game, for you know, for for games like League of Legends or Dota, the map doesn't change very much. So for StarCraft, things like maps, I think, are a really, really big way yeah. to make your tournament stand out compared to other ones when there are so many StarCraft tournaments running, and while normally that's still even done within one v one, I feel like. Being able to set your tournament aside as being unique in some way is very important. Either your tournament is unique because of the prestige behind it, you know, like you're doing, um, you know, WCS championship, right. sure, you know, all the big tournaments will follow right. that, but the biggest of those tournaments will still have their own, you know, unique um, aura about them, even if they're still using the standard map pool, uh, just because you're playing on a big stage, for yeah. example, like the Intel Extreme Masters Championships coming up this next week. So... For smaller tournaments, especially if you're trying to get viewership or get people excited, um, I don't think it. Uh, I don't think it makes sense to try to do the same thing that everyone else is. So, do you think like because when I think of Nathaniel, you know, I just think of grassroots. You know, the working man, StarCraft Two cast. You know, initially with when you started out with Quantic Gaming and you just did those super late night casts, just casting Pro League and all that stuff. It's very. It felt like it was this extremely grassroots thing, and then and then you developed into becoming one of the major talents around in terms of casting. So I just think like, um, how do you view the entire grassroots scene when it comes to StarCraft? Do you think there's still room for it to like explore that area? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, it's it, it all depends on where you want to work, right? The the thing is, uh, StarCraft has a desperate need for people to produce consistent content. You know, right. there's not a lot, and people take uh, you know organizations like Base Trade for granted. Yeah. Um, they were coming up around the same time that I was doing all of the B streams, and now yeah. as I've moved into commentary. You know, they end up doing all the B streams, but you know, the thing is, there's there's really nobody else that's working in that space to you know really get a brand around yeah. producing content that isn't premier tournaments. You know, there's no there's no comp competition for those guys, and as good as they are, if if they're busy, you know, it makes things tricky. So it's very important that people in the community continue to work on things and. Smaller tournaments like um, the Ascended Star League that have been running really consistently, they're very small, but um, I think tournaments like that that give opportunities to players that aren't at the premier level yeah. as well, it keeps that scene alive because the last thing that you want to do is for people to feel like they're shut out because they can't compete at a pro level. And I, I think the same thing goes for people that are trying to run those tournaments as well is that you know you can have the, the, every man, the everyday man um, thing. But as far as, you know... Is it, it, it's still really, really difficult if you want to yeah. move into the into the premier space, right. either as a content producer, kind of like how I, I did moving into casting, or as a player. Yeah. Okay. So, <clears throat> I think the biggest news nowadays, or like that's come up, propped up this week, is obviously that Legacy of the Void might just be the beta might just be right around the corner. So, I mean, um, obviously, what do you feel like if we just talk about you personally? What do you feel about like the chance to be part of the game now when the beta is already coming out? Because you know, during the like, uh, um, Wings of Liberty beta, that was just when the fire started, really, with people like Husky and HD and Day9 all being able to just produce so much content because there was so much interesting stuff. Like StarCraft 2 was so new. Do you think that there will be this entire wave of just like? 
holy crap, everything is new, everything is completely different, there's so much to explore, like, do you think that there will be an upsurge in terms of your own personal career due to Heart of the Sword, uh, Legacy of the Void coming out? I think it's it's hard to say anything but yeah, yes, you know. I my my career or at least my professional career in StarCraft 2 and esports didn't it was like starting to get going like yeah. as far as doing big tournaments around the time that Heart of the Swarm beta yeah. came out. And at that point, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't like big enough in the space that, you know, that I was really doing it as much. You still have a lot of content coming out of people like Day 9. Um, I think as Legacy of the Void moves into beta, with how many things are changing, yeah. you know, it's not just units. The economy is changing, so the way that people set up their bases, the way that people build armies, the way that you expand, harass, all these things are going to change in so many different ways that I feel there's a massive, uh, you know, at least when I, from a content producing standpoint, a massive amount of stuff to cover, to go over. Right. And as someone who likes to look at the, try to look at the game from a different perspective, I like to do a little off the wall builds, you right. know, I like, but I like to tweak things to, to my own style. I feel like there's a lot of opportunity to come up with cool ways uh, to play the game, at least until this a, a new standard meta is created by yeah. the professionals. So, Legacy of the Void for for content producing purposes, you know, it's already got me excited enough. But I feel there there's almost you know a, a limitless potential for what you could do as far as covering everything that's changed and really exploring new ways to to play the game because it's not it's not going to be the same game anymore yeah so like overall are you just do you feel it might be some weird saying like will it fix heart of the swarm because it's like i don't think the game is necessarily you know it's not broken per se but it's just more like people are obviously just thinking that the game isn't interesting to watch in a certain to a certain extent but like do you think that Legacy of the Void will fix all these issues or is there like you know from what at least what's been announced Or do you think that there's still a lot of work to be done to like make it a, a big viewing sport once again? I, I mean a lot of people don't really give heart of the swarm the credit that it yeah. deserves um, I, I you know, it's it's very easy to forget the two-year period of just brood lords and investors being yeah. built and that's and that was like it right yeah, so um the, the dynamic range of strategies in Heart of the Swarm has already blown Wings of Liberty right. beyond any point that anyone recognized. People, people will still complain, but I think Legacy of the Void changes it so much that there's no position where you just look at it and you're like, oh yeah, this is like a couple tweaks, right? Yeah. Like no one, no one can say that. Someone who was upset with Wings of Liberty looks at Heart of the Swarm and there are a lot of things that are similar as far as you know, the economy, there's still a lot of death balling, yeah. but you know, for the, for the most part, I feel Heart of the Swarm did a really good job of, of shaking things up. Legacy of the Void changes so many other things. I, uh, I, I, really, I really find it hard to believe that the, the problems that people see in StarCraft II right now will still exist just because players will have to spread themselves out more yeah. to take more bases. Um, you know, you'll be rewarded more for harassing and expanding since there's just less resources. Yeah. So overall, just do you think that this is what StarCraft 2 needs or do you think that it'll at least get to a level? Because it's already at a pretty comfortable level, you know, all things considered in terms of esports. I mean, esports like Quake are still going on and have an active circuit, even though they don't have maybe the same shine as maybe a game like Dota 2 has, you know. But do you think that StarCraft 2 is at least going to be in a stable position where it will be a fun viewing sport for the next couple of years? Or is that too early to say? Well, I think... I, I personally find StarCraft still entertaining to watch myself right now. Like when you watch at the highest level, I mean, you know, even, even talking about things like Death Ball, it doesn't even happen that much, except when you get into late game PvZ and Swarm yeah. Hosts being adjusted kind of kind of writes that off a little bit since um, the, the way that, that, the way that, that the matchups are going to be played is going to change significantly when, mm. you, when you can't afford to do as much because you start with more resources. So it's tricky. Um, for a spectating experience, the most important thing that uh, I think everybody kind of agreed on a long time ago is that the game needs to be more accessible. You know, yeah. um, when you sign in, you know, make the the chat channels are you know more difficult to find. I yeah. think you know I think these are the kinds of things like the the BattleNet interface. I think is going to have uh, one of the biggest impacts on how it goes. And by interface, I mean everything. You know, the, yeah. the way that the chat is set up. Um, the way that clans are set up, the way the ladder looks, you know, making it making it easier to follow for a casual player to actually gauge how close they are to being promoted, yeah. things like that, are, are what's going to keep people enticed to play. And 
trying to move away from this very anti-social environment that Battle.net, it's kind of been for StarCraft 2. You, you never really had this vibe when you logged on that there were a bunch of people that you could play with. It's just press find match and then go up against some random guy, yeah. win or lose, and then that's just kind of how it goes. So um, I really like how the game looks as far as, I don't think that should be a problem spectating wise. Blizzard's been doing a, a very good job of focusing on fixing the problems that people want to see uh, changed. Mm. But the the real big thing is going to be how Battle.net is. You know, yeah. are we gonna are we gonna see those things that make the game accessible, or things that make people want to stick around, like skins, like a better uh, way to communicate with people, things like that. You know, having clan ladders are the kinds of things yeah. that I feel keep people very interested when they don't uh, have aspirations or the time really to try to become you know a top tier player. Yeah. So if we look. If you look beyond Legacy of the Void, or maybe not beyond, but just beside Legacy of the Void, obviously the first WCS season of the year started. And I think that just from your perspective, what was the most interesting thing to happen in the round of 32 with like, you know, Naniwa being eliminated, Serral dominating his group, and then just an Australian player, a pig, making it through? Like, what was, what was the most exciting for you in terms of like casting and just seeing how it happened? I mean, if you I mean, if you know my story, you know I'm I'm all about the the guy coming out from yeah. from being very small or unknown to to really showing everybody what he can do, and I was actually very impressed by Kelizer's results in the round of 32, um, taking his first match against Tilo. He didn't end up making it out of his group, but mm -hmm. I feel the games that he showed, uh, the the community response to his play. Yeah. You know, he didn't do anything cheesy. Uh, he just played a very straight up style against one of the you know one of the most loved you know, foreign players out there and I, I hope to see guys like him pop up more. Get those storylines yeah. win because that's what the region lock was that's what it's all about. So that you can see, you know, the, this top tier player from Brazil that doesn't get enough credit for his skill or doesn't have enough opportunities to show people his skill to get credit for it. So that to me was a really big result. And of course, um I, I like you mentioning Pig of course. Yeah. Like I, I love seeing these you know these guys being able to come out because it's very difficult. It, it, in, a, in a very similar way for Kelizer, there's not a lot going on in, um, in the, the Oceana yeah. scene as far as you know StarCraft goes. They have the, like, the ACL, but that's that's pretty much it. They don't have too much uh, else to actually compete in. Mm. All right. Well, um, any predictions going into the round of 16? Uh, I just... Hmm. I think it goes without saying. I uh, I wish everybody luck against 4GG and Hydra <laughs> <laughs> and Polt. Yeah. And someone, I'm sure somebody out there is quite happy that Violet didn't make it yeah, through the round yeah, 32 because yeah. <laughs> I think he's still a very scary <laughs> opponent as well. But uh, man, I I gotta be. I'm just gonna be cheering. I'm gonna be cheering for 4GG. <laughs> he's my boy. He's my boy. <laughs> okay. Then well, I don't have anything else to add really. So the final word's yours. Uh, just. Thanks, thanks for chatting, man. I uh, hope you guys all enjoy WCS and Fragbite. Yeah, thanks. Have a good one.